Okay, good morning everyone, good afternoon or good evening from wherever you are from the world joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us today for the 29th edition for the CVC Insider Series. This week we have a great session ahead of us. We have Jim Adler from Managing Director at Toyota Ventures joining us. He has an incredible career and story spanning startup strategy, private equity and corporate venture. But before we get started, let me just quickly set the stage so you all have a little bit of context. First of all, my name is Omaira. I'm part of 500 startups. We are the world's most active seed stage investor with over 2,500 direct investments in startups from 75 different countries. Within 500, I work closely with corporate investors, innovators to power their own projects, partnerships, and investments into startups. We started this CVC Insider event series as part of our efforts to help raise the bar of corporate venturing and build a stronger and more supportive ecosystems for startups and investors alike. Every two weeks, we host this roundtable featuring top corporate venturing practitioners who share their unique journey into the CVC specific challenges and best practices they developed as a result. Our host, Nicola Savage, will be moderating our discussion, but there's also a Q&A function, so please, please, please feel free to ask any questions you have in the Q&A section, and we will promise to do our best to cover them. And now you know the backstage, I'm going to pass over to over our host, Nicholas. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amira, and thank you, 500 Startups, for this very meaningful initiative of having practitioners from corporate venturing sharing their journey, as well as uh, best practices that they've learned along the way. Today is really special with Jim joining us. I've uh, watched him many times, and he's extremely thoughtful and articulate and opinionated about corporate venturing, which is what we want from this next one now. Jim, if you don't mind uh, giving maybe five, 10 minutes about your personal journey into corporate venturing. Sure, Nicholas. Uh, again, thanks for having me. Uh, so I have had a, a very, uh, in, in some sense, intentional journey, but a, a rather unintentional journey as well. I started my career uh, in electrical engineering. Uh, and my first job out of school was launching rockets for what's now Lockheed Martin, uh, which a job I just loved. Uh, nothing is more exciting than uh, uh, sitting at the, at, the, at the foot of a 300 foot booster uh, before it launches into space and spending countless hours in, in, in the integration labs and, and, and really seeing all this technology come together uh, to do something so uh, magnificent. Uh, but what I didn't really love about uh, that the industry is how big the companies are. And I had this entrepreneurial itch uh, that after about a half a dozen years, I really wanted to scratch it. And so I left, uh, I left at that time was General Dynamic Space Systems, later uh, Lockheed Martin bought them uh, to start a, a series of, of, of companies uh, either as a founder or as an executive and uh, it's probably lasted about 20 years and and uh, 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 from digital signal processing companies to cryptography companies one of my companies was a, a voting company where uh, we did what was called at the time uh, distributed multi-party computation uh, now they call it blockchain. So we weren't really good at marketing. We we're really good at the tech. Uh, and, uh, and it was really for public sector elections, either electronic or, or online. Uh, and we ran that company for about nine years, raised a bunch of money from institutional VCs and, and corporate investors like Cisco and Hewlett Packard and, and others. Uh, uh, struggled uh, being too early, struggled with the uh, the political uh, season where we had really great revenue years and then in election years, then it would, it would uh, uh, ebb and then flow again and uh, pivoted the company, sold it to a company called Intellius, uh, where I really found my second career. So uh, let, me, let me step back and say the way I kind of lay out my career, it, I, was, I was a geek for a while. Uh, and then I was uh, a suit for a while as an entrepreneur. And then I, I kind of was a, a wonk. Uh, I was the chief privacy officer at Intellius. I also ran the data science team uh, as well. So I, the geek and the, and the wonk kind of coexisted in Intellius for a while. But I really, I'm, I wrote a couple of blog posts about my accidental chief privacy officer stint where I fell into this world because 
being in voting for so many years, I knew the privacy community incredibly well. Uh, I'm not a lawyer though. So I used to, I would hang out with these lawyers, these uh, most chief privacy officers are lawyers. I was an engineer and, but I brought this unique perspective to the privacy community, uh, which was always really welcomed, uh, which I, w- I was surprised. I thought I would be judged and cast out, and, but it was really a, a unique perspective. Uh, remember Richard Feynman, famous Nobel laureate, used to play the bongos. And then when he, he would, and he played a very unique uh, style, which was I think South American. And, and when he would play with the natives, uh, that, uh, of that type of music, he never really got it quite right, but they always really uh, uh, enjoyed his unique idiosyncrasies around the style. And I think that is always something that uh, should be appreciated. And I, I really was thankful to the, the other privacy community leaders and experts that welcomed me in with this weird technology uh, approach to privacy. Uh, so Intellius is a whole another story that, that we can get into, but I, I was only going to be there a year uh, because they were in some trouble and I helped them get out of that trouble and ended up spending almost five years there and really had an itch to do another startup. Uh, and so I joined a, a company called Metanautics that was founded by a Googler and a Facebooker and backed by Sequoia Capital. And we ran it for about three years and uh, sold it to Microsoft in 2016. And... Uh, I ran products and marketing for Metanautics. And, uh, and as you can tell from my career, I, 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 I do a startup and then I rest. Uh, vote here was my startup. I kind of rested in Intellius. And then I did a startup at Metanautics. And then I thought, well, I need a, an emotional rest. So I thought Twitter would be a good rest. Uh, and I was hired in actually not to do anything with venture capital at all, but to run their data uh, and cloud team, which I had done few times before. I, for me, that was a rest because I love engineering teams. I find they, they're incredibly invigorating and I, I just love uh, leading technical teams. So I did that for about a year. But when Twitter Research Institute was founded, they had this little kitty of money uh, to invest in, the, in Valley startups. And so I started to go on some of their pitch meetings and I kind of realized that there wasn't a process. There wasn't a set of goals. There, 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 it really wasn't well structured. And um, as you can tell from some of my writing, I have hard opinions about corporate venture, having been on the other side of the table as an entrepreneur receiving corporate money. And and so, and I'm not shy about sharing my my perspectives. And I please did. don't be today. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't be. Uh, and so, I have some very strong opinions about uh, recognizing that startup is the customer. And you need to have a well-defined process. You have to serve that customer well. And there is a, which I know we'll get into, what does the corporate venture uh, uh, function need to do to serve that customer well, that startup customer well? And so I wrote a manifesto, effectively, uh, said, okay, these are all the things. It's easy to say what's wrong. It's much harder to say what, you, what should be done right. Uh, and I had strong, strong opinions of what should be done right. And so we ran up the chain, up the chain all the way to Japan, and uh, they loved it. And uh, uh, and here we are. So I, I I I was the accidental chief privacy officer, and now I kind of find myself the accidental accidental venture capitalist. Uh, <laughs> and here we are, four years in. Uh, Toyota Ventures has now 500 million under management, a little over the, that. We've done 40 investments, uh, and we do them now in two funds: a frontier fund which is $350 million in artificial intelligence and autonomy, mobility, robotics, cloud. And we just recently expanded to smart cities, digital health, fintech, and energy. Uh, And then a climate fund that's doing renewables, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, and of course, hydrogen. So it's really an incredible journey. And uh, as Buffett says, uh, you should dance to work every day. And I certainly do. Well... Uh, you have proven you're also a really good storyteller. So this is really <laughs> cool. Let me start at the beginning because I think there are so many analogies between startups and launching rockets. And you literally did launch rockets <laughs> as a job or contribute to launch rockets. What did that tell you these six years you spent um, 
uh, in aerospace that you still use today mm -hmm. in your um, venturing mindset? Yeah. Uh, well, I, my electrical engineering background was in it was in control systems, right? So linear systems. Uh, and what I, I realized uh, in the that everything is a system. Uh, it might be linear, it might be nonlinear, it might be stochastic. Uh, uh, but whether it's a, a, a physical system uh, or a psychological system or a business system or a legal system, these are all systems. And if you try to understand the dynamics of that system, you can actually get the performance out of the system that you desire. So, uh, that has been kind of a through line through my career uh, uh, that I'm kind of a generalist, clearly, right? I started off in, in engineering and here I am investing and there was legal and privacy along the way, but they're all systems. And it's really interesting because I started, my first year of college, I was pre-med and I thought my, my father was a doctor, my grandfather was a doctor and I was supposed to be the, next, the third generation of a uh, physician. And, uh, I really got to the point where I, I just realized I did not really want to be around, you know, sick people my entire career. Uh, it was just hard for me. I, I you know, I, you get really attached and I just couldn't fathom <laughs> being around, you know, that kind of difficulty my whole career. Uh, and I kind of rebelled and I said, I'm going to be an engineer. And my dad, he didn't know what an engineer was. He thought I'd be driving a train, maybe. <laughs> he wasn't quite sure what engineers did. Uh, but then it's funny, both of my father and my grandfather, they're internists, right? They're not, they're, they're not surgeons. They're not specialists. They're, they're generalists, right? They're internists. They understand the whole body. And here I thought I was rebelling. And then the engineering discipline I took was really a generalist systems <laughs> kind of to uh, a different box a different box but here i you know I, it's the prodigal son i try to run away and here i found myself right back in this very comfortable place of trying to understand systems and so when we do investments i'm always thinking about okay what kind of system is this uh when i, I remember in, in intellius when we were uh uh, Intellius is a, a, a place where you can buy uh, background checks and phone reports, and uh, it's very much like a people search engine, really. Uh, and I used to, as I said, run the data science team, and, and I had these data scientists saying, well, let's just change this. Uh, let's have less search results. Let's have more search results in order to ma maximize conversion. Uh, uh, or let's change colors or number, you know, all these different things. I'm like, well, what kind of system are we dealing with? Maybe if we changed everything, nothing would happen. If we changed one pixel, everything might happen. How do you know? I mean, one of the principles of, of system engineering is impulse response, right? You hit something with a hammer and you see what happens, right? And so I said, well, let's calibrate our, act, our actions to the response that we, that we desire of this system, right? Are we dealing with a skateboard or a battleship? If you hit a skateboard with a hammer, it moves pretty well. If you hit a battleship with a hammer, it doesn't really move at all. So part of this is how do you calibrate to the system you're working with? And that, I think, is very important with markets. What kind of market are you dealing with? When, when startups come in, I always say, okay, is the market big enough? Is it broken? Uh, is it ready for disruption? And then what's the vector to affect your disruption? But if the market is not, assuming it's big, that's easy, what's the TAM, but is it broken and ready for disruption is a question of the dynamics of that market. And so I always wanna know from entrepreneurs, why do you think this market's ready to be disrupted? I mean, this comes to, I spent nine years selling to governments, federal, state, and local, that market was not ready for disruption, <laughs> really, you know, really, uh, at least in a venture capital scale perspective. I wish I would have known that uh, or appreciated that earlier, uh, because I think understanding the dynamics of the markets that you're trying to achieve financial success or strategic value uh, for a corporation is really important. And these system ideas, I think, are really valuable to attack the problem in a systematic way. So if I double click on the control system analogies, 
Especially you mentioned as an entrepreneur, you had experience with corporate VCs. Same for me, and they always were black box to me. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what ticked for them. And I feel mm -hmm. like what you've done with all your writing and, and videos is trying to make it a white box so people know what to expect from mm -hmm. you. Right. Um, first, was it your experience in the past that they were more like black box? And how important is it to actually open the box so that people actually know what you care about? I think that um, human systems, right? <laughs> like human behavioral systems, really react much better to uh, expectations that are clearly articulated and then met or uh, over uh, met. Uh, and so I think when you have black boxes, uh, you, you build in uncertainty into, into the interaction and in uncertainty. They, they, they say about business, what, you know, what is, what do the markets hate? It's not the markets hate bad news or good news. The markets hate uncertainty. Yes. And markets hate uncertainty because people are involved in the markets and people hate uncertainty. If you give me the bad news, at least I know what to do. Right. I, and of course, if you give me good news, I know what to do, but if you don't tell me anything, I don't know what to do. Mm. And, and so if I'm going to trust the people I'm going to choose to do business with, and I want those people to choose us to do business with. They need to understand what motivates us. They need to understand what our expectations are. We want to understand what their expectations of us are. And if you do that from arm's length and from behind a veil, I, I don't think that works. Uh, and I think being at Toyota, where we are transporting people's loved ones, their most precious thing in the world every day, we are a very transparent culture in many respects because we can't hide. And one thing, there's several things about Toyota that have really in, impressed me in, in surprising ways. And that's been sort of these, these, these sort of cultural threads of transparency and humility uh, that have translated into our approach to venture very well, where entrepreneurs, you know, they don't have room for error. And if uh, I've had really great corporate investors and I've, I've had terrible ones. I had a corporate investor that almost killed my company inadvertently. They just didn't know what they were doing. They bear hugged me, almost put me out of business. Uh, and I never wanted Toyota to be that kind of investor. I wanted Toyota to be a respectful, responsive uh, investor that, you know, to use my, my medical roots, you know, would do no harm. First, do no harm. Right. A corporate investor should not do harm. Yep. They should, you know, at, at the very least. And they should at the be minimum humble. at the minimum. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so many corporates do a lot of harm and not purposefully. They just, you know, they're a black box and, and they don't and, and they don't understand. And they're not humble enough to understand the, the startups. And therefore, they they do things they shouldn't do. So actually, so Toyota is an amazing company. Many books are written about the Toyota way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So yeah. clearly they are open and humble, which is really a rare combo. How much of that DNA helped you to create Toyota Ventures the way you want it to do, which is indeed transparent, humble, and all of that? Um, I think it, it was this um, serendipity uh, that, uh, I mean, I wasn't going to get into corporate any other way. Uh, and so it's not like I knocked on Toyota's door and said, hey, I'm going to be I want to be your corporate venture guy. Uh, I never said that. I, I just said it, it was this sort of this accident of they wanted to do more in the valley. I had some strong opinions. I could articulate those opinions. Uh, it turned out that the values that I thought were non-negotiable, they also thought were non-negotiable. Nice. Uh, now, the devil's in the details. Right. And we can talk about some of those details. Uh, but if you don't have the overarching values right, it doesn't matter what details <laughs> are involved. Right. If you're not if you don't have that that long term horizon, you don't have those those uh, values of humility and integrity and openness and uh, really just respect for the people you're working with. Uh, no details are going to be able to fix that. Yeah, yeah, the high level, the why first. So I guess my question was more about for the audience, if they work for a company that's not as transparent and well known mm -hmm. to be transparent as Toyota, what advice would you give them to still be able to set a corporate venture unit 
that would mm -hmm. try to be more of a white box versus a black box? Yeah, uh, I, the, the way I approach, and this really gets to the business units, I think, uh, uh, and, 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 and the corporate leadership, what, what, are they really at, what are they really trying to get out of their corporate effort? Uh, I think that's always important it is to, everybody has objectives they're trying to achieve. If, if the, uh, but a lot of times they're not well articulated or they're not well understood. And so like any sales effort, the idea is to understand what you, who your customer is and what do they want. And I treat our business units also as customers. I say, like, what are you trying to do? I know what I'm selling. I know what I could, I know that the value I can bring, but do you even care about that value? Uh, and so I think there's always a process to understand what the, uh, what the business units want. And a lot of times it's not what the startups can bring. I, I mean, I, I always think about early stage startup investing is like a telescope into the future, into the far future. But business units uh, are really uh, income statement driven and they're like a microscope or a magnifying glass into the very near future. <laughs> and so if those time scales are not appreciated, business units are not gonna have their, their uh, their expectations, uh, expectations met. So part of this is calibration. Uh, there are certain business units across Toyota that totally get what we're doing and love it. There's others that don't want to touch what we're doing. They're just, they're focused on getting the cars out, the most reliable, uh, uh, best cars, uh, uh, safest cars on, on the market today. That's their job, you know. They, they pay for our investments. So, you know, so I, I love what they do. Um, there's others that are more innovative, that are more forward leaning, that are looking a, a little bit uh, toward the horizon that I think might makes more sense. So it's, there's an impedance match between yep. what they want and what we can deliver. And uh, I think that's job one. Job two is very soft. Uh, it's emotional. Uh, Sometimes integrate innovation groups don't really culturally match the business units, and I, I I think about it like you know Gandhi has this you know ha had this great articulation of you know first you know first they laugh at you first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they attack you then you win. Uh, sometimes business business units. I mean, in 2017, many of them just ignored us, and then that we popped on the on the on the scene and they kind of laughed at us and they patted us on the head and I, you know, Jim, you're playing your sandbox. That's great. Uh, we're doing real work over here. Um, and then by 2019, some of the, you know, when we got the next, we, so there were, the, the trajectory of the firm was hundred million in 2017, another hundred million in 2019 and now 300 million in 2021. Uh, by 2019, that second hundred million, they're like, Ooh, this thing's growing. It's not going away. And there were some feelings of, wait, why, you know, I, I don't, I don't like where this is going. And there were, you know, some, some, in some quarters, some uh, ill feelings. And, uh, but as 2021 came and they started to see that startups were working with many companies, uh, many business units around the company, they started to understand when Akio Toyota said, we're a mobility company, they really was, they weren't sure what that meant. But as they saw the portfolio grow to now 40 companies, they, they see what that means. They see the startups we're working with uh, and they see the exposure to that kind of innovation and disruption. They're like, ah, that's what Akio meant. <laughs> and, and it really pulls it into full relief of what this landscape uh, is, in, is evolving toward. And more importantly, what is Toyota's role within it? Uh, and now they see it and they're like, wow, let, and we're, we have a, a portfolio support team that just, their whole job is to connect our portfolio to Toyota. And they're doing that every day, building these bridges to all these business units. And some are not ready, some are ready. And we continue to build the bridges and everyone runs at their own pace. And it's worked out incredibly well, but it's taken a long time. And I've sit, sat in many meetings, and I'm sure many in your audience have sat in many meetings where the business units that are making the real money in the business have no time or tolerance for the corporate team. They, you're just like, you're not playing with real money and you're wasting their time. And we would 
articulate our value that we're trying to bring. And a lot of times we'd leave them, I'd leave the meetings where they would say, Jim, I don't get it. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this, uh, this doesn't work for me. And I'm like, okay, that's okay. I don't have to win this meeting. <laughs> right. We're going to have more meetings. We're going to, and we're going to bring more, we're going to have more examples. We're going to, you know, we're going to, I love to be the happy warrior. You know, you got to be a happy warrior and, and the arc of, of the argument is long and you have to sort of say, okay, see you next time, you know, and we'll give you an update. And I hope you'll listen at least to the updates and what we're doing. We do an internal newsletter. We do quarterly updates with executives. Our portfolio support team meets with business units, regularly, monthly or quarterly. And so there's this drumbeat of what's going on. And pretty soon they're like, they start to, they start to listen to that drumbeat and ultimately maybe they'll start dancing to it. So, well, first Toyota was not a car company when it was created. Right. And so know. when your CEO is saying it's a mobility company, it's already indicating a pivot is happening. And that may be very abstract for most people in Toyota when the CEO says we are a mobility company. I want to ask the questions because your portfolio company is probably the closest to an articulation of what does that mean, mm -hmm. which comes with responsibilities as well. Right. So how do you take that statement from the top, articulate it into your investments in a way that we will talk about you being financial first, but right. there's a strategic element, there's a messaging element. How do you take that responsibility into account? Yeah, um, I think it does come to vision, mission, strategy, tactics. And, you know, and, and I, we are very deliberate and intentional about how we think about each of those four. How do you think about vision? Vision is where the world is going. Okay. And our vision is machines will continue to amplify the human experience. Nice. Okay. I mean, it's a simple, I mean, we don't think machines are going to replace humans, you know, we, but we think if you ever hit the accelerator in an LC 500 or a Toyota Supra, you feel accelerated. <laughs> Toyota knows how to match machines with humans. Okay. Uh, that's the vision. Our mission, Toyota Ventures mission in that vision is to discover what's next for Toyota. It's very simple. Our job is to discover. We're a discovery engine, okay? We're about exploration. The business units are about exploitation, right? Exploit the markets, do well in the markets. Our job is to explore. Uh, and, and so if you have that framing, then you're like, okay, what are you exploring? And our job isn't to find the next incremental advance in, uh, you know, uh, uh, cruise control systems, you know, automated cruise control systems or something like that. Uh, our job is to really consider the technologies and businesses that Toyota might find themselves in in the future. Uh, I mean, you look at one of our investments, Joby Aviation, right? They just went public and... and uh, Congratulations. Uh, thank you. It, it was, it's been an awesome journey and, and we're incredibly fortunate to be uh, part of that journey. Uh, but when I, this was one of our first investments in 2017. Uh, I think the fund was announced in July and we made the investment in Joby in August. And there was a lot of pushback that we were Toyota AI Ventures at the time. Uh, and we were, because we were aligned so closely with Toyota Research Institute, it was about AI and autonomy. And the pushback was, there's no autonomy in these Joby this Joby Aviation product, uh, and this is one of your first investments, Jim. You really, do you really want to take on that political capital uh, expenditure, you know, effectively? Yeah. And this is where you got to really kind of dig deep and understand, like, what is your mission? Yep. Our mission is to discover what's next for Toyota, and I and my and that told me that said if this is the flying taxi, if this is the air taxis, air, if air mobility is really going to be a thing and Toyota is not in the middle of that, that's malpractice on me. If I had a chance and I said, no, no, I don't want to expend the capital, shame on me. And, and I was so blown away by the product and the service and the noise and the safety. It was just amazingly uh, uh, thoughtful vehicle and the service around it. And the founder. 
and the founders and the team. It's just, you know, Joe Ben and Paul and the team, just amazing. And, and how can I walk away from this? And so I fought pretty hard for it. And the only reason I was able to do that is a clear articulation of the mission that we were on. And that is so important. And then after you understand your vision and mission, how are you going to achieve that mission? And that gets to the strategy of, okay, well, if we are going to discover what's next for Toyota, who is going to deliver on what's next? Well, startups have been the engine of disruption and innovation for the last 60, 70 years, longer than that if you, if you squint. Uh, how do we attract the best teams? How do we attract the best founders? Well, it all comes down to trust. Right. And so uh, and trust comes from alignment. Uh, you know, Howard Schultz, you know, famous secretary of state. I think he just passed away a year or two ago and lived to 100. He said, you know, nothing else matters in any negotiation but trust. And that's the only commodity you really have uh, to get things done. And I we have been very intentional about the trust that we've been trying to build in this market. And it gets back to your white box, black box question, Nicholas, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, if we were going to attract the best teams, we have to align with them. What do they want? What do the co-investors want? Why do they want us at the table? They only want us at the table if they can trust us. And you only trust people that really fundamentally want the same things that you want. And what does everybody else want around the table? Success, financial success. Uh, and so we are very strident that financial return must precede strategic return. Strategically, that's incredibly important for us. Why? Uh, so that everyone wants to win around the table. You know, they can't have Toyota's version of winning be different than the founder's definition of winning. And then you're sitting in the boardroom and every word that comes out of your mouth, they're like, do they really want to win this? Or are they just trying uh, financially win this? Or are they just expressing some corporate imperative uh, that they need the startup to fulfill? And you cannot be in that position. Or they're not going to want you in the room. And if they're not going to want you in the room, they're not going to want you on the cap table, and you're not going to see the best deals. And corporates often get this exactly backwards. They're like, well, since financial returns don't matter, I mean, Toyota throws off 20, 30 billion in profit every year. There's no way my little pissant fund is going to put a nick in the corporate profits of Toyota Motor Corporation. No way. OK, so, of course, they don't care about financial return, but they do care about strategic return. And if I can attract the best teams and give them exposure to the best teams in the world, that is strategically valuable to Toyota. So from our little venture group, we need to be financial return before strategic return. So that's one of our strategies. There's others, but that's kind of job one. Yeah. Uh, by the way, financial, financially strong startups also make very good strategic business partners down the line, right? Yep. You know, strategically aligned startups that are financially weak are not going to be trusted by the business units anyway. And so they're not going to, the business units are not going to find them valuable. If they're financially strong, yeah then the competitive juices flow and they're like, oh, we got to work with these folks because our competitor might. Yeah. So it just is this beautiful, pardon the automotive metaphor, flywheel that keeps spinning, you know, getting faster and, and builds more momentum. Uh, and then finally, the tactics, right? How do you work with startups to deliver value? How do you treat them like customers? We do a net promoter score across our portfolio uh, periodically to say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Startup, you are our customer. How are we doing? Are we living up to our expectations? Where are we falling down? Uh, where can we do better? Uh, it's important to actually really, really, really intentionally, viscerally treat them as customers. I really like the way you articulate it. It makes a lot of sense. I will confess, I hate the question of are you strategic or financial? Yeah. And I got to a point where I refused to answer a questionnaire if this question is on the scale and you have to choose between the two. And right. um, I had one questionnaire where they really wanted me to answer and they said, why don't you answer? I said, because of this. And they changed the question the way I want it. So, <laughs> but at the end, I think what you're saying and the way I, I look at it is your job is to pick the winners. 
The winners yeah. are going to be financial returns if you're good at picking the winners. Mm -hmm. And the winners are the companies that the corporation will want to work with. Right. And that's where a financial VC is all about picking winners. And a CVC should be about picking winners. That's Joby right. is, at least for now, clearly a for winner. Now. <laughs> and, <laughs> Not good, and, okay. yeah. and, and Toyota is investing in the company and will engage with the company. So clearly, this is about picking winners. I think I want to go back to one of the comments you made about impedance match with the business units. Mm -hmm. And I think not all corporate VCs are the same, but you're extremely explicit. And I love the words. You say you're explorers. So you were very explicit. You're not looking at the near term. You're looking at the future, what the future might be for Toyota. Mm -hmm. How do you handle the impedance match or what recommendation would you give to the audience to understand the impedance match, but also to um, know when to act and when maybe not to go too fast. Yeah, I, I think that uh, think of your corporation as a, a cell, right? A biological, we'll go back to the medical, my medical roots, right? A biological cell. Uh, and that's the corporation. And and the and the, the startups are, you know, these, you know, uh, nutrients potentially on outside the cell. And your job is to, uh, you're, you're sitting on the semi, the venture group sitting on the semi-permeable membrane between the two. Uh, and your job is to bring these nutrients into the cell. Uh, and at, almost as a host, right? You're, you're the host that's going to bring this nutrient into the cell. Uh, and then the, the cell organelles, right? The, the pieces in the cell are gonna actually uh, utilize those nutrients. Uh, some of those nutrients will not be uh, effective or, or desirable to certain of those organelles inside the cell. Uh, the corporation is very much uh, the, 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 the cell and these organelles are these business units. And, and the job is to figure out uh, which nutrients map and could be utilized by which organelles. And, and, and so at a place as big as Toyota, uh, the way the reason the, the place where the metaphor breaks down is these cells and nutrients are evolving very quickly. And <clears throat> the nutrients are evolving very quickly. The startups are evolving very quickly. So when we introduce a company to these business units, uh, sometimes uh, certain groups are, they want very mature uh, partners. And so we recognize that we want to put the, these startups on their radar. We want to uh, introduce them. And then we want to provide them updates because these startups evolve very quickly. Uh, they're not static. They're, they're very much, uh, uh, they're organisms of their own right. And they're more like stem cells and some, they, you don't never know what they're going to turn into over time. Um, so certain business units that require more maturity, we want to be in the introduction and update mode. Mm -hmm. uh, and then certain groups within the corporation are going to be very hungry for innovation. Uh, we have some groups that are incredibly hungry. They want to see the startups almost when we see them. And they want to introduce them. They have innovation programs. They want to bring them into their labs. They want to figure out what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we've had startups go through this process, and now they're involved in you know, uh, uh, multi-group uh, 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 supplier relationships. But it started in a very humble way when the startup was much less mature. And then it, it, it grew over time. So I think the key is, you grow these things over time. You don't just plop it down and say, hey, here's a startup. Do you like them or do you not? And they say, well, we don't, and then goodbye forever. No, you cultivate, you're a farmer, right? You grow these relationships, right? And, and sometimes you gotta, you know, you water a little bit more, you, you know, you, 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 you update, okay, now this thing is germinated, now it's flowering, now it's, and pretty soon it's gonna be an oak. And you're like, and, and from the corporate's perspective, you want to show them that, that arc of growth yeah. uh, and demonstrate that in, in many, many, many ways. And I, I uh, sorry to mix metaphors, but I will. Uh, we build bridges to these business units. And some of these bridges are rope bridges. Some of them uh, over time become stronger wood than suspension bridges and between the innovation we're bringing in and how they can absorb that innovation. 
And we recognize that some groups just will, they're like on the rope bridge, you know, mode. And they're like, okay, we really don't want to connect too hard to this innovation because man, we got, we got quarterly uh, numbers to hit and we just don't have time for that. Yep. Peace, man. That's okay. Yeah, we're, you know, we're not here to win. We're here to help. And that's, that's what's important. Like, again, be humble. Like, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not a hammer looking for nails. Uh, we recognize that you got to, it's like jazz, you know, more metaphors, right? <laughs> you know, we're here to work with you and figure it out and, and, and give you exposure over time. And I think it's not one size fits all. And you just have to have a thick enough skin where you're okay being rejected. Maybe that's my startup roots, right? I, you know, my first company, I probably had to give more than a hundred pitches before I got my first nickel. Uh, I, I'm a, it's, a, it's okay to hear no. No is no, fine. You know, it, failure is fine. As long as it, you learn from it and you, you manage your risk, that's okay too. It's, it's a long life. And, and uh, you know, there's always second acts. I, I can't agree more. <laughs> my next question, I'm probably nearly uniquely positioned to ask you. <laughs> You're not Japanese. <laughs> you're not know. in tokyo you're not a lifer in toyota that's five yeah only five years yeah exactly so how come you are the one heading the corporate vc and what values does that bring versus being a lifer japanese in tokyo for the same unit um it's a really good question nicholas uh, i think there is a uh I think I, th there's a level of, of uh, different experiences that I bring to, to this enterprise. Uh, uh, I'm also, I think, I think there's a lot more expected from a Toyota team member who's been at the company 20, 25, 30 years. Uh, and, and I think in every corporation, there is, a, there is a corporate culture that you just can't help but uh, absorb and live and breathe. It's, it's, uh, you don't even realize it's there, right? There's that famous, you know, uh, a meme about, you know, two goldfish in a, in a, in a bowl. And one says, uh, uh, how do you like the water today? And the other goldfish says, what's water? <laughs> <laughs> right? and, you know, you just live in it. You don't know it. You're just there. Uh, it's the an anchor time. for sure. Yeah. And so, uh, so certainly bringing these different experiences and also I get a pass, right? I get a, I can be a little bit more obnoxious. I can be a little bit more pushy. Uh, long as, you know, long as those values we talked about, transparency, humility, respect, those things are cross culture and international, right? Those are human things. You gotta, you gotta make sure you're human. Uh, but I, I think, I think if you, can disagree without being dis without being disagreeable. If you can demonstrate the opportunity without uh, doing it in a uh, an obnoxious or flagrant or uh, 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 touting way, uh, I think that that you can really thrive uh, in 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 these. And I, I'm I've been pleasantly surprised. Uh, uh, that that there is this hunger, uh, certainly within Toyota, for what we're doing, and that but that hunger has kind of shown itself over time, uh, and and I think it, you know I'd rather be lucky than good. I mean, the reality is the the environment is changing, right? The 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 competitors, traditional competitors of Toyota, uh, the other automakers, that's changing, right? We we know how to to win in the automotive marketplace. That marketplace is changing. Big tech is coming in. Mark Andreessen was right. Software is eating the world. Cars are on the menu. What are we going to do to actually thrive in a world where trillion dollar companies uh, are, are our competitors, not companies that are worth tens of billions? How do, you, how do you win there? Well, hybridization is part of the answer. Diversity is part of the answer. Uh, not completely. I mean, there's so many things at Toyota that we don't want to change. The Toyota production system, the to to Toyota production system, the Toyota way, those things really shouldn't change. But how do you evolve those amazing corporate capabilities 
into the next set of capabilities that could open a new chapter of success for the company. That's what's really interesting. And, and what I've noticed is Toyota is really good at making high quality machines at scale. The challenge with Toyota is they don't know what to build next. And this culture and process of innovation that we've been talking about really gives them an on-ramp to innovate. It lets them manage the risk as they go. I mean, the, the challenge with Toyota and most automakers, I think, is when people's lives are at risk, you must go slow. You must be careful. You cannot tolerate a type one error. Yep. Type when, when, you know, type one error, people, people die, right? If you do the, you know, if you if you do the wrong thing. Yep. So people are very understandably reluctant. And that that has seeped into the culture. My argument is, hey, if lives are at risk, you're completely calibrated correctly. But if money is only at risk, you're not calibrated well, because then you're going to make a ton of type two errors. You're going to miss a lot of stuff. And the and corporation don't experiment not, enough. That's right. You, yeah. Not enough exploration. Right. And so that's what we bring. We bring this thing. Look, your risk profile is perfect to keep people safe in the, in, the, in the products that we deliver to the market every day. You're miscalibrated for discovering what's next. And both things can be right at the same time, but in different areas. And that's my job. My job is to say, and I hear this all the time, Jim, we can't do that. That's too risky. That's too this. That's too that. I'm like, what are we risking here? We're risking a few million bucks on an investment? Eh, that's kind of what we're here for. I remember when I first pitched the fund to one of the top executives at Toyota, the edict was, Jim, every project in Toyota must be profitable in three years, every single one of them. And as a corporate investor, right, I had two choices. I either had to munge my fund model to show that everything would be profitable or everything would succeed. I don't or think I could that say, would meet your manifesto. <laughs> it, it would, no, it would not. So, I, I mean, I dismissed that immediately. And then I said, I'm sorry, one th at least one third will just, we'll lose all our money. And I said, if you can't handle that, then you shouldn't do this. Now, it turns out that the, the upper third will pay for the lower third uh, and ideally more. And that's the that's the the uh, that's the alchemy of corporate venture capital or venture capital generally. If you can't get on board with that, this isn't for you, <laughs> right? And I think it's a golden nugget for people listening, which is really be strong about what you need, and that's going to be different from the rules of the corporate. Right. I just mentioned your manifesto, so I don't know if it addressed that, but as a corporate VC. Who is your customer and what is your product? Yeah, so, uh, so our, the, w the way we frame it is the, the startup is our customer, okay? They deliver the value back to, uh, to us and then through us to our, our limited partner. Our limited partner is the corporation uh, and the startup uh, is our customer. And I, I think that framing works incredibly well. Uh, it also fits very well. Like we have, and we have a, a limited partner agreement. We have a subscription agreement. We are structured like uh, an institutional VC. We have a capital call process. We are we are incented like institutional venture capitalists. Uh, there are certain hills you should be willing to die on when you structure your fund. Uh, that you know, I just told you a story. That that executive would not meet with me after I articulated this one third, one third, one third notional fund model. Yep. Luckily he retired and, and again, rather be lucky <laughs> than good. Uh, and, and you know, I continue to, to make that case, but you have to understand like every limited partner you're going to have a negotiation with on terms of the fund. So if you think about it that way, my negotiation was, was with the top executives of Toyota on what this fund would look like yep. and what 
What's wh where do they get the strategic value? Where does the financial value come from? How does that going to work? It's an LP negotiation. Okay. If you treat your startups like customers, it's a very different negotiation, right? It's about service. It's about support. Uh, it's 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 not it's not legalistic in in comparison. And not transactional. Right. It's it's it's. It, it, it's a balance sheet forever, forever relationship. And you should think about it that way. I mean, look, ideally we want to invest in companies that are successful where those entrepreneurs go found another company that we invest in. And, you know, this just keeps the gift that keeps giving. And we want, we want to be a value added part of this ecosystem. And therefore we have to respect that ecosystem that we live in. The limited partners are going to get value from that ecosystem only if we can manage that community well, and we are a responsible member of that community. If we're not, the LPAs, the LPs are not going to get any value, no matter how the LPA is written. It doesn't matter. And, that, and you have to be really, really intentional about that distinction. If you're not, then you're just random walking and maybe you'll get lucky and maybe you won't, but uh, you know, it, it, it's not going to end well. So it's a great advice. I, I agree. Now, what is your product? So the, the product that we deliver is, you know, what do we deliver to our, to our, uh, our customers? We deliver capital. Uh, we deliver integrity, support, uh, strategic alignment, uh, uh, access to the corporate parent, but not obligation to the corporate parent. Like, because we're financial return before strategic return, if the company does not, a startup company does not want to work with Toyota, we're totally okay with that. We're, there's no business terms required. There's no- Only no if it first. makes sense. There, yeah, there's right. So the product is capital plus plus, right? Yep. Uh, going back to my programming roots. Uh, that's real, that's our product. And we, and we resource that. We have a portfolio support team. That's a, a big chunk of our staff their only mission is to deliver value to our startups. What's the That's percentage it. of your team uh, working on that portfolio? It's probably, it's definitely more than half. Oh, okay. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, it's about, yeah, I think, yeah, it's about, about half. Uh, I mean, it's sort of like everyone sells, right? And, and when I, you know, when I was in startups, right? Everybody sells. Yeah. Uh, in our team, everybody supports. Everybody, everybody sells and supports the customer. Uh, and so, when our startups call, day or night, weekends, they need to talk to me. I, I'm, I do everything I can to be there for them. They're the customer, and I, and and the product we deliver is. Uh, that kind of access, that kind of perspective, whenever they need it, whenever they need it. Uh, I think that's, that's what they're getting. And, and part of that product is the product is not going to hurt you. Right? We're not, you know, we're not selling razor blades uh, to unsuspecting customers that are going to cut themselves. Yep. Uh, yep. We, you know, we, we want to deliver a safe, reliable product, not unlike a Toyota, right? I, during COVID, uh, when we were all locked down, we did, we did, I think, eight deals that year. We usually do about 10. Uh, like your Toyota, Toyota Ventures wants to be as reliable. We want to be yeah. there when it's snowing outside, when it's cold, when no other cars on the street are starting, your Toyota starts. <laughs> right. That's what we, that's the kind of investor we, we want to be. And, and I think that's, that's an important product to deliver to the market. My first car was a Toyota. I worked in Siemens in Munich in the winter where it was minus 20 and it started every morning. So that's, clearly hey, mine too. I had a Toyota Corona with my first car and I had Celicas and Forerunners and they always started, they always took you where you wanted to go. <laughs> and I, I, I think that's that's that value, right? I that's mean, a brand promise as well. Yeah, Absolutely. it's a brand promise. That's the promise. So it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the same in my team, which is I have an investing team and a platform team. And I joked that the only reason the platform team is not called TDK Goodness team is because I expect everyone to bring the TDK mm -hmm. Goodness. And that's yeah. what you say, which is everyone is supporting. That's right. Let me ask a question, which is about KPIs. And of course, you mentioned about 
financial, so carry, you talked about NPS, Net Promoter Score. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to the audience the KPIs you believe really matter for CVC to be highly functioning and delivering on that promise to the entrepreneurs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our model is really uh, institutional VC or bust, right? So when in doubt, institutional venture capital has done a pretty good job, you know, unlocking disruptive and innovative companies over the last 60, 70 years. So uh, you look at on the, so let's break it up into financial return and strategic return, because you're right, it's not a choice. It's a false choice. If anyone says, are you financial or strategic? It's a false yeah. choice. It's yeah. a false choice. So our KPIs on the financial side are institutional VC uh, uh, KPIs. What's your total value to paid in capital? Uh, what do your distributions look like? Uh, th those are, you know, IRR, right? Those are your financial, you know, those are relatively easy, well understood. Um, on the strategic side, it gets a little harder. Uh, but the way we think about it is you think about, you know, we see maybe a thousand companies a year, 800 to a thousand companies a year. Uh, into a funnel that comes out with 10 companies that we invest in every year, right? Roughly. Of those companies, how many of them engage with Toyota at any level? POC, some kind of look, something that maybe is on paper, you know, some, some contract maybe, you know, something that even if it's lightweight, uh, kind of the uh, introduction strategic value like am i are we giving exposure do any groups find any value uh and granted toyota has the the luxury of the law of big numbers right we have many bus so uh we usually there are some B business unit within toyota that says oh yeah i'll take a look at that uh, and then the next rung is how many of those uh in the portfolio actually will become suppliers to toyota uh, or partners you know kind of income statement, P&L type partners, right? So uh, there, there's like the P&L KPIs. How many actually get a look and how many actually have a more formal supplier relationship or partner relationship with Toyota? And then the next rung is kind of balance sheet engagement. How many companies does Toyota follow on on investment? Uh, uh, and then ultimately, how many companies would uh, has Toyota purchased that are in our portfolio? Uh, and so if you think about it that way, uh, it's about giving the, the corporate parent exposure uh, and, then, and then actual engagement uh, and, and just tally those numbers. I mean, just tally them and, and caveat them like we, this, is not, this is not perfection and, and precision is your enemy here. Yes. Uh, right. You know, it's not the trends you know, matter. The trends matter. Are you are you resourcing this kind of engagement with the business units? Uh, and if you are, I think, and you're patient and vigilant and resourced appropriately, I think you'll find that you can then go in and we do this every quarter. Every quarter we provide a, 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 a deck that talks about, hey, what are our financial return numbers? What are our strategic return numbers? Right? And we usually highlight a few case studies and by and large, Tony's like, yeah, I want more of that. And, and what's fascinating is if you look at just a lot of corporates ask me this, and you haven't asked me this, but I'll volunteer it anyway. They say, <laughs> you know, how do you justify this? How do you justify this expenditure? Like, because we're a fund, right? We, the reason we were able to be active during COVID is we had a fund. I didn't yeah. have to go back to the corporate parent and sort of beg for money during a terrible time. Because I always knew that business cycles ebb, you know, ebb and flow, right? It's a certainty. It's a certainty. I didn't think it would be global pandemic, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I knew it was going to be. And so I wanted to make sure because I wanted to be reliable for our customers, our startups, I know I knew we would need uh, a level of, of certainty. So I wanted to fund, right? That's why I wanted to fund. And so how do you justify it? Well, you look at Toyota, for example, Toyota, has an R&D budget of about $10 billion a year, roughly, okay? So you look at us, you know, maybe we're over the last five years averaged out, we're roughly a hundred million bucks a year uh, in 
in this uh, uh, endeavor, this venture, which is about 1% of our R&D budget. But that's not where the story ends. You're gonna get that most of that money, if not more back. And Toyota is incredibly patient, God love them. They're an incredibly patient company. So the, the internal rate of return and they wanna get it back quickly is not as much of a concern, but over the term of the, of the fund, 10 years, 15 in, in case of the climate fund, but 10 years, they're gonna get the money back. And, more. and so you're getting this exposure, you're getting paid for the exposure to this innovation. How do you not do this? How do you not want to do more of it? Because you're getting this exposure for free. Better than free. The question is not how do you justify it? It's more how do you justify not doing it? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and I think that the, the traps people fall into is they try to satisfy the business units who are very short term in their thinking. And so therefore they want to say, how, how can I get value out of this startup uh, next quarter? And when they don't, because the startup's immature, they're, they're, they're like, oh, this is, a, this is a mess. Business units should not be the arbiter of the strategic value uh, of the portfolio over a short duration. Yeah. Talk to me after the fund is done in 10 years and tell me if you got any value out of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the right way to think about it. Don't fall into the BU trap because they're, they're living on the P&L. They're living to the next quarter's earnings report. They're not living on the balance sheet and thinking 10 years out. And you gotta, you gotta really, again, a hill to die on. Don't get sucked into their game. Articulate your game and educate them as to why your game is really important for the long-term value of the company. And by the way, you can afford it because you're getting, you're getting more than your money back. It's, it's a golden nugget. So we are at the top of the hour, Jim. So I will ask one final question from the audience, which I think would be a good way to finish inspiring. Uh, what role do you see for Toyota and Toyota Ventures in smart cities industry? Yeah, well, uh, you know, Toyota is a, as we've talked about, a mobility company. Toyota has uh, launched Woven Planet, which is a, uh, a many different companies. There's, there's the Woven City effort in, uh, at the foot of Mount Fuji, where the, it's a kind of a living laboratory of, of all kinds of amazing technologies. Uh, and so we think that, I mean, obviously, I, I wrote a blog post uh, in 2019 about the unbundling of mobility, uh, which is really about smart cities and uh, the idea of the personally owned vehicle package is, 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 is splintering into all the ways we move around cities and, and the world. Uh, and cities have to respond to that, uh, that, that uh, kind of different trips we all take throughout the day. Yeah. Uh, and that the mobility side is reshaping cities, right? We were in New York and the, the, the bike lanes are incredible now. We, yep. we went from, from Queens all the way up to the Upper uh, West Side, all the way down to, to, uh, to uh, Soho, you know, all day. And in these great lanes that were, you know, well uh, manicured and painted and safe and amazing, right? Yep. So cities are getting smarter. They're getting more respectful of other uh, and supportive of other mobility modes. Uh, we think technologies are going to continue to uh, innovate in that space. Uh, we think buildings are going to respond in kind. I think the buildings are going to get smarter. Uh, and uh, we, we have several companies that are doing robotic kitchens for uh, these, these buildings. And, and we think e-bikes. And well, I mean, we have a great investment in Revel uh, in New York City uh, that's doing it, uh, electric infrastructure along with a bunch of consumer services, ride hailing and, and mopeds and others. Uh, so we think this is an incredibly exciting time uh, as cities get smarter uh, and we're going to be in the middle of it. Uh, certainly Toyota Ventures and, and certainly Toyota. And I think we're only scratching the surface. It's super yeah. exciting yeah. journey. Early innings for sure. Jim, thank you so much. This was a really good discussion. Uh, so much to, uh, to take in. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nicholas.